Good evening, and thank you for coming to this forum, sponsored by the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions at St. Petersburg College. My name is Dr. Jim Oliver. I'm the provost of this, the Seminole campus of SPC. And it's my particular pleasure to welcome you not only to the forum, but to our digitorium uh, with our media wall behind us uh, that we can use as, as really the, one of the finest presentation auditoriums in all of Tampa Bay for us to talk about this most important topic to our community. Um, it's great to have the audience here. We're also pleased that some uh, folks are watching live on SPC TV, uh, and this broadcast will no doubt be rebroadcast uh, on SPC TV as well. So we expect that the, the statements made and the questions asked and the answers provided uh, will, be, uh, su will be supportive of getting to the uh, information we all need to make an informed decision um, for uh, in many forums to come. Um, it's uh, good to see students in the audience. Um, we like to see uh, our students become part of the of the process. One of the primary roles of the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions and our bachelor's program in public policy and administration is to engage our students in the issues of the day, and this clearly certainly does that. Before we go any uh, further, I'd like to acknowledge the media sponsor for tonight's program. Let's give a round of applause, please, to the, for, to the Tampa Bay Times. <laughs> On a personal note, I'll just let you know that this upper respiratory thing I have is not contagious, especially not to those watching on TV. Uh, this is another uh, in the Institute's forum series. They're all free and open to the public. Uh, our other major series, called The Village Square, offers programs that include a buffet dinner for which there is a charge. 2014 offers us many opportunities to highlight important public policy issues, and this is an election year. The Pinellas Transit Tax Referendum is just one of the several ballot questions the voters will face on November the 4th, and we intend to cover them all in forums just like this. That's what we do. Part of the Institute's mission uh, says it is to be, quote, an objective, nonpartisan venue for civic debate, addressing real world problems and the needs of the community and the region, end quote. The Pinellas Transit Tax Referendum certainly fits that mission. Uh, we have invited representatives on both sides of the issue to present their views to us and then to engage in a conversation with each other and with you, the audience, about the many facets and issues surrounding this referendum. In addition, we're very excited. Tonight, for the first time, we're going to invite you, the audience, to have a role in the program. The college has recently acquired, um, for instant polling and use in cell phones and text, some software called Poll Everywhere. Um, since so much political discourse is based on polling, we're going to use instant polling to measure the results of tonight's forum. Here to explain what that means is David Clements, Executive Director of the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. David. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. Uh, this is for everyone who has a cell phone. You need a cell phone to take part in this survey. And for once, when you have entered an auditorium, you're going to be told to turn your cell phone or keep your cell phone on, not off. However, please silence the ringer. And for those watching on, on uh, live on SPC TV or on your uh, live streaming on your laptop, you can join in the polling with your cell phone from home or wherever you are because this is about texting, what our students do, what your children and grandchildren do a lot of the time, texting. So um, we're going to ask you what you think about this issue before you hear from the speakers. And, and near the end, we'll uh, take another poll and ask you what you think of the issue now after you have heard some of the d debate and discussion. And I want to em emphasize that this is not a scientific survey. We do not claim it is because this is not a random audience. These are, this room is full of people 
with uh, uh, who are advocates for one side or the other. Uh, think of it as uh, more like a straw poll. And uh, Wikipedia says a straw poll is a vote with non-binding results. They provide dialogue among movements within large groups. I like the definition by dictionary.com a little better. It said, a straw poll is an unofficial vote taken to obtain an indication of the general trend on a particular issue. That's what uh, our survey will be, an indication. So here's what you do. Take out your phone and go to the text function. There should be the phone, the number up there that you dial is 22333. That's the equivalent of your wife or your husband's text, your mobile phone number. But that's what, that's what this is up here. And then, once, you're, once you have that ready to, to type in a message for yes, you favor the referendum, it's Y, Ref 1, yes, Ref 1 is what that means. If you oppose it, it's uh, N, Ref 1, and if you're undecided, it's U, Ref 1. Uh, we're trying to make it logical, so Y is for yes and Ref is for referendum. And one is the first of the two surveys that we're going to do. Uh, some of you may have questions. Our polling guru, Shante Williams from our staff is there. Uh, raise your hand if you're having any trouble getting that. And the results should be showing up as, as you do it. Okay, any, uh, no, I don't see anyone having any trouble, so I'm going to turn the mic back to Dr. Oliver. There's someone, Shante. Mr. Neary is having a problem. Uh, Dr. Oliver, to get the program underway. Thanks very much, David. Uh, obviously, it's fun to watch the results coming in in real time. I know none of you will be looking at me. You'll all be looking at the poll. That's okay. Um, thanks, David. Uh, it is my pleasure to be part of this program as the moderator this evening. Um, I believe that the moderator moderates best who moderates least. So I'm going to say very little, leaving time for the, uh, our, our two speakers to speak and for you to ask questions. Um, this is about helping the voters understand the issues they'll face in the poll in November. Uh, mass transit, you all know, is a complex issue. Um, so it's good to have forums like this so we can clarify to the extent possible all the issues that are in play. Um, I'm, I don't want to, to uh, uh, belabor the poll. Uh, we've got about 34 results in and uh, 35. We still have folks voting. Uh, but I think um, in the interest of time, we're not going to uh, – I'm looking to see if people are still working on their phones. Uh, by the way, um, you can only vote once. Uh, so, so if you, if you are texting your friends on the outside and, and suggesting that they all text into this number, uh, I, well, that would work actually. But uh, you can only vote once from your phone. Um, uh, so if you change your mind, you can change your mind, uh, but you can only vote once. Uh, what do you think about this technology? You think this this could be fun? This is our first time we've tried it. Um, and <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, there we go. Uh, it's uh, the, the, uh, when we have our next program on, uh, on medical marijuana on the 17th of this month, uh, we're going to ask a series of four poll questions. Uh, it's it's going to be very, very interesting to gauge the audience in, in events like this. Um, I think at this point I'm going to close the poll. Uh, and and if, we, uh, if we take our straw poll at this point, we have 24 who are in favor. 11 who are opposed, and 5 who are undecided. It'll be very interesting to see at the end of the night if we still have 5 who are undecided. At this point, um, it's time to begin the discussion. We'll start by giving each side 15 minutes to present their point of view on this referendum proposal. After that, we'll spend a few minutes uh, discussing some of the points made, and then we'll open the floor for questions from the audience. To start, uh, I'll call on Mr. Don Ewing, who is the chairman of Yes for Green Light and president of the Council of North County Neighborhoods. In his day job, he's the president of, you're going to have to help me here, Harrispecs? Harrispecs Business Software. Mr. Ewing will speak in favor of the proposal. Mr. Ewing, 15 minutes.
stole about a minute of my intro there, so I can uh, dispense with talking about myself, but it's one of my favorite topics, so I'll do a little bit of that. Um, I've been uh, a Pinellas County resident for 28 years. I grew up, I moved here from Pensacola, so I technically can be a Florida resident for a long, long time. But in 1983, I moved to Palm Harbor, and I've been in that area um, ever since then. Raised a family here, created a business here, um, and have basically tried to get myself involved in the community as I found the time to be able to give back to the community. <clears throat> During that process, I got involved in several um, government-sponsored events and, and uh, um, studies and things related to transit. Transit kind of pulled me into it um, because I believe that it's a very important and um, necessary function for our county. Um, I involved. I was in part of about 10 years ago involved in various things that either through the council, uh, the uh, chamber, or through the council of North County neighborhoods got invited to attend, and they were very exciting. It was nice to be able to be one of those people whose opinion counted, and the ability to be able to actually go out and participate in in uh, government or business, uh, trying to provide information to us or, or involve us in the decision. So that was kind of important, and that's how I got to this point. Basically, is. Um, I got invited to join the Greenlight Pinellas campaign and to help advocate for it. Tonight, I am here uh, to speak to you about Yes for Greenlight. Yes for Greenlight is the campaign that is trying to bring, trying to convince you and provide information to you to be able to make an informed decision about transit, this initiative and the referendum that's on the ballot this fall. Um, I have a son in college. He. Uh, wanted a car early on, but he now has the ability to take transit around the campus, college campus and does that every day. Um, I'd like to actually kind of start and uh, invoke the memory of Disney in 1966. Walt Disney, when he was buying up acreage in, uh, in the Orlando area, bought 27,000 acres before anybody really knew what was going on, and the Disney folks were planning a, a uh, a model of their California world, but they are also trying to build a, uh, a city of tomorrow. So in the evolution of this in the mid-1960s, early 1960s, the Imagineers at Disney designed what was now we know as Epcot, which was the city of the future, and it was designed to be a pedestrian-friendly, transit or car-free environment where the people that lived there could live nearby um, anything that they needed, whether it was shopping or business or education or or fun, they could take either public transit or take, <clears throat> excuse me, um, or walk to these areas. So it was a walkable, livable community based upon not using your car every day. This was in the middle 1960s when they were doing these kind of decisions. Um, what came out of that was a, was a study and a vision from Walt Disney World that says transportation was important to Walt's Epcot in his first Florida press conference. He reflected, I feel that you can design so that the automobile is there but still put people back as pedestrians again. To this end, trucks in Epcot would be relegated to underground tunnels, and the layout of the city was designed to discourage car use. How many of you have been to Disney, ever? How many of you stayed on property at Disney, one of their hotels? I would be willing to guess that you drove there, somehow took transit there, got to the hotel, left your car there, and experienced Disney for two, three, four, five days without ever getting back into your car again unless you were going to another another facility. That's basically what Walt was designing was a, a, an environment that you could bring your car to get there or take transit to the facility and then rely on the infrastructure that's built there. The reason I invoke this, this vision in this memory is this is very similar to the vision for Greenlight Pinellas. Greenlight Pinellas vision is basically to um, not make us Disney World, and I'm not talking fantasy here, Epcot's reality, but it's basically to leverage some of those ideas to communities and involve and uh, uh, more walkable communities, better transit, better use, less use of our vehicles, um, better abilities to get places without actually having to get in our car, and you know destroy the ozone there with your uh, your emissions. So, what I'd like to do right now is to uh, uh, show you a little bit of a little video that talks about the green light vision and the green light. Um, um, ideas of the future. So this is our version of uh, Disney's Tomorrowland. So hopefully, uh, there we go. This is a two minute video, so enjoy. 
In the future, Pinellas will experience longer commutes and congested roads, which will have a negative effect on our economy and environment. In the past, we've widened roads to move more people, but with land at a premium and safety a concern, it cannot be our only approach. The future vision for Pinellas includes transportation options, such as light rail, to connect major residential employment and other activity centers, combined with better bus service. The Pinellas Alternatives Analysis proposes 24 miles of light rail connecting Clearwater, Greater Gateway, and St. Petersburg. A link to Tampa will also provide a connection to Hillsboro. Bus service will be greatly enhanced to provide a vital link for neighborhoods to access the rail line. This is actually this the gateway vision area also Roosevelt. provides greater economic development opportunities. Light rail may encourage housing and commercial development to cluster around stations, similar to what other cities have experienced. What will riding light rail be like? It will be reliable, comfortable, safe, and convenient. Greatly improved bus service, working together with light rail, and integrated with driving, walking, and biking, will make a seamless transportation experience. A stronger transportation system in Pinellas will create jobs and stimulate the economy, enhance our quality of life, encourage vibrant walkable communities, and retain the character of our neighborhoods improve mobility with efficient and convenient options and support the environment. The vision for the future of Pinellas transportation enhances connections for people and places in the county and the region. To learn more about the Pinellas Alternatives Analysis, visit PinellasOnTrack.com. Okay, thank you. So, not Disney, but it's this is a real life look at uh, what the rail system and the enhanced bus system can do and provide for, for uh, Pinellas County. Um, basically, I want to talk about now, um, talk, to, talk to you a little bit about the plan. I want to talk, give you some of the highlights of the plan. I want to give you some uh, benefits from the plan, and I'd like to close with showing you who's been involved in this plan to date and, and uh, who's a yes for green light today and answer any, any of your questions afterwards. So. I want to start off by saying I am not a mass transit expert. I've been, as I said, involved in some of these uh, charrettes and things, but I am not the detailed guy. We have folks here that can answer detailed questions later if need be. But basically, Green, um, Green Light Pinellas is, is the plan to bring enhanced transit, light rail, economic development, and a better quality of life to Pinellas County. As you see from some of these bubbles here, um, there are, how can I have more job opportunities? It can bring jobs to the area, possibly. How can I keep our property values up? The economic development side of that models that property values do increase around transit stations. How can my employees get to work on time? Big input from businesses around the area that they like to employ and, and in larger centers, be able to get folks to their uh, businesses on time and in a safe fashion. How can I get home from class at night? We're in exactly a perfect place. And St. Pete College is exactly a, a great um, uh, kind of example of this. Uh, speaking with the provost of the uh, St. or sorry, the Clearwater College, um, and he was saying that with the campuses spread around the county, it's very difficult for students to be able to get to and from classes or to and from the campuses via public transit today. They can't get. They may be able to get here for an afternoon class, but if they're having an evening class, the bus service typically stops at about six o'clock. So they can't get home, so they have to rely on other options. That's some of the problems we're trying to fix with the enhanced transportation plan. Um, how can I make it easier for tourists to get around? How does a tourist get from Tampa Airport or St. Pete Airport to the beaches or to any of their hotel destinations? Today, it's impossible just about to get from TIA to Clearwater Beach or St. Pete Beach in a mass transit fashion. Um, that's one of the problems we're trying to cure as well. And what can I do, what can we do differently for our community? It's about community redevelopment as well. <clears throat> so if we talk about the main components of what the Greenlight Pinellas Plan provides, it provides easier access to works, one of its main tenants, better bus service, uh, light rail options to get from Clearwater to St. Pete, hopefully regionally someday. Uh, provides a fairer tax, we'll talk about each of these a little bit more. And it helps with Pinellas County's future. This is an important aspect of the plan. All four points are, are important as well. 
So the first part of it is lots of bus improvements. Like I said, I'm not a, not a mass transit guy, but the kind of things you see here is uh, part of the plan today, which is a well-vetted 40-year in the making plan. Um, it provides more frequent service, extended hours, a supporting bus network, enhanced trolley service, regional express buses to Tampa and, and other destinations, more community, uh, flexible connections, more community circulators, and also light rail. So these are the main components of what this plan is going to bring to you today. Here's an example of what the, the spaghetti model here, and fortunately it's on a very big screen. It's hard to see when it's on a small screen. But this basically will show you, and the, the uh, things on the left talk about what the bus plan portion of it's about. There's going to be a core route network, which are the red lines, run up and down the Pinellas County and across uh, east and west. Those are going to be increased to 15-minute bus service on weekdays and weekends, and also be able to provide um, bus service till midnight in most cases. So that's part of the enhancements and the extra money we'll buy. Frequent local routes, uh, those are the yellow routes across through there, mostly mid and south county. Um, those will be increased to 15-minute rides and possibly 30-minute um, uh, timelines in between the service, and it'll run to about 11 o'clock at night. The purple lines mostly on the coast in North County. Those are very popular today. Um, they are uh, mainly for our tourists to get up and down from one beach to the next, but also takes you all the way from Tarpon Springs through Clearwater all the way down to St. Pete Beach. You stay on a coastal route for that. Uh, it's a trolley looking thing. I'm sure everybody's seen those. And they do, uh, they, they draw people in just because they're not buses, they're trolleys, right? Um, Regional express routes, the green routes you see going up and down the county, but mostly over to Tampa, through Oldsmar, through uh, Courtney Campbell Causeway, and also across the Howard Franklin Bridge. Those are regional bus routes, or these are bus express routes that will take you from a park and ride or somewhere here in Pinellas County, either to the airport, downtown Tampa, and a couple of other destinations. Those are very important. Um, connector routes are the black routes. Those are, um, sorry, the black routes outlined in the, uh, in the orange there. Those are the North County Connector. This was a service that started about a year ago um, in North County to uh, provide service for them. It's a flex bus service where it allows the user or the driver to deviate three quarters of a mile, I believe, from the route to pick up somebody, bring them into the route system, and carry them through to their uh, back into the route system, and then also drop them off if they call in advance. So that's been very popular. It's up to 3,900 ride segments. Um, a month now, so over in just a year's time. And then community circulators, those are going to be in tight areas where we're going to be able to bring people from short distances to the bus system. And then someday in the near future, uh, possibly 10 years from now, the light rail system that runs from Clearwater through Mid-County here and then uh, down to St. Petersburg. Here's an example of what a, uh, this is actually 4th Street and 9th Avenue in downtown St. Petersburg. This is kind of an example of a bus rapid transit type of bus that will not have dedicated lanes, but it will have areas where it can pull off the main road and be able to pick folks up and move on. So uh, that's one of the aspects of it, just kind of a rendering of the actual 4th Street uh, north there. There's also a new light rail system, as we talked about. It's 24 miles of light rail. It's going to have 16 stations, one at each end and 14 in between. Um, and it, the plan is that it will take about 57 minutes to go from the first stop in downtown Clearwater to the last stop in downtown St. Pete. Here's kind of the route again that shows where it goes from Clearwater through Gateway area, winds its way down um, to downtown St. Petersburg. Um, there'll be 16 stations. Um, they're expecting about 24,000 trips per day on the rail line once it's fully operational and in place. Um, and basically uh, some other ideas there, but that's really just showing you where it's going to go. The bus system will be designed to feed that. The third part of the, of the Pinellas plan is to provide economic development opportunities for around the rail stations. Historically, when a rail system goes into a new town, um, there's uh, development that's built up around these, sta these station areas, and these are just some ideas. There's uh, jobs that will be created as a result of those, that development around the stations and the rail system itself. Um, there'll be quality communities developed, there'll be uh, connections to people and places, and it's environmentally friendly. 
So here's just an example of an artist rendering of a station kind of area in an urban setting. This could be downtown Largo, this could be Clearwater or St. Petersburg, but this is the kind of walkable community that's trying to be designed in the concept here. So part of the benefits of green light is action. Uh, I'm sorry, access. Um, there'll be a 65% increase system-wide of the bus service. There'll be 80% more weekend service, shorter wait times, uh, more service and direct trips, so there'll be less transfers needed uh, once the uh, system is in place, and a trolley service, which has been very popular on the beaches and in North Pinellas County. One of the other options, one of the things it provides is, uh, is options. Uh, it gives you new connections, new services, helps reduce road congestion because it will get some folks off the road riding a bus. And then last but not least, it's been designed by communities. And what I mean by that is, uh, we'll see that in just a minute, but one of the other things it provides is opportunity. So opportunity brings us um, the investment, uh, which in studies have said that the investment in public transportation is about four to one in the development aspect around that transit system when it's put in place. Once completed, 80% of the residents will live within a quarter mile and 86% will work within a quarter mile of a bus rapid transit system station. Um, here's some concept drawings that were created through that service that, or that uh, time we talked about where there was um, citizen input required or asked for and people can uh, participate in what was called charrettes where the community design were created around the train stations. Here's some examples. This is Woodlawn uh, Station in downtown St. Petersburg, 22nd Avenue North under I-275. These were all designed by people who live and work in those areas. These weren't people countywide. Uh, I participated in one for the Clearwater South Station, and that was all we got to put input into. Here's one around the Bayside Bend, Bay Vista, think tech data area of Roosevelt. Here's one um, in the Largo Town Center. This is where it's just showing, it shows you today and then the, the expected or anticipated possibilities related to transit development. And let's, so let's talk about, in, in closing up here pretty quickly, everybody says, how much is this going to cost us? Well, simply put, there is a one cent sales tax that we're, being at, we're asking you to approve in November to add to the funding. The property tax from, from uh, PSTA will go away, so the 0.75 mills or 0.75% that you pay today will go away, completely be down to zero, you'll pay just sales tax. If you own a home or if you live in a property in Pinellas County that's average or the median value is about $160,000, $170,000, and from the IRS uh, studies of a family of four making average wages in Pinellas County, that there will be, you'll either break even or have a couple extra bucks left over paying sales tax, instead that extra penny of sales tax, instead of the property tax. So if you own property or rent because your property owner is, is paying property tax, that property tax goes away, you're paying um, sales tax, and from the IRS, they say it'll be about a break even if it's a $160,000, $70,000 house. Um, sales tax is not levied on groceries, medical supplies, and it's limited to the first $5,000 of any purchase. You go out and buy a car. Um, you're only going to pay an extra $50 for this one cent sales tax because it caps at $5,000. You buy a $25,000 car, you pay $50 more with this extra penny of sales tax. And 5 million tourists that come here every year will pay for one third of the sales tax. These are state numbers in Pinellas County that say that our tourists that come to this area pay on the current penny about one third of that tax. So, PSDA and the plan is credible, reliable. I said it's a, it's a process that's been 40 years in the making. It has been vetted by national consultants. Um, it has been reviewed by a top five nationwide accounting firm to say it's a fiscally sound plan. The county commission and the PSDA agency um, have had their audits every year and they've come out clean and they've done everything. They're fiscally responsible, the county oversees that. And then going forward, if the new plan is approved, there will be a citizen oversight committee created that will be independent of the PSTA, but be um, basically their watchdog made up for folks like you and me that will be able to sit on that board and make sure PSTA does the right thing with the funds. In addition, in the interlocal agreement it's called, the county commission will actually control the sales tax dollars coming in before they get to PSTA, so they have control of that meter in case something went totally wrong, the county actually has control of that money. It's going directly to PSTA. 
So, this is the referendum that you'll be asked to sign, the actual ballot language you'll be asked to sign in November 4th. And the title of it is to levy a countywide 1% sales tax surtax to fund the Greenlight Pinellas plan for public transit. Summary says that shall the improvement, construction, operation, maintenance, and financing of the public transit benefiting Pinellas County, including an expanded bus system with bus rapid transit. And um, I'll let you read the rest there and ask you to vote yes or no for it. Quickly finishing up, we're asking you to be a yes for green light tonight. Here are some folks that are involved in the campaigns today. These are folks that have come out in support. These are various government agencies. Here are some businesses and business people that have uh, come out in favor of, including all the major chambers. You'll see some names up there you might recognize from areas. And then last but not least, we ask you to be a yes for green light. I appreciate your patience tonight. And uh, I hope that you will take the time to find out more about the plan. Visit our website, yesforgreenlight.com, or visit PSTA's website, greenlightpinellas.com. Every fact and figure you'd ever want is in those areas. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. Uh, now we'll call on Barbara Hazelden, who is the campaign manager and spokesperson for No Tax for Tracks. She will speak in opposition to the proposal. Ms. Hazelton. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening. And um, I, I just wanted to, I, I was thinking as, as Don was talking about the, my nine-year-old granddaughter who asked a few months ago if there was a Santa Claus. And we're still lying to her. And uh, <laughs> she, 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 took, she, was, she was happy about it this year. I don't know if we're going to get away with it next year. Uh, but but uh, I'm afraid that I have to be the one to say that there really is no Santa Claus. Uh, and when you look at, uh, just to, to talk about Disney for a minute, um, I did a little quick figuring here, a family of four, $100 a day, a four-day average day. That's um, roughly when you figure their other profit centers that they have, which is why it works, because everybody that walks in the door is not only paying to get in, but they're staying at the hotel. They're eating dinners, they're buying snacks, they're buying Mickey Mouses, they're buying ears and an average family of four just for four days. is about between $4,500 and $5,000, which is why Disney works. So uh, our government officers should be doing what needs to be done in our county and not what they envision to be done because after all, Walt Disney was an entrepreneur and that was a private business. So that being said, um, I would like to just go through because I have been to, uh, for three and a half years, I have attended the PSTA meetings. I have watched this process, uh, and, and it's been um, uh, very interesting to watch. So with that, I'm going to quickly go through, and I'm going to talk very fast. And first of all, we do not have a surge in public transportation. Recently, there was a story that came out about that, and the fact is, is that the city of New York has been the, uh, the reason that there's been any kind of an increase in public transportation last year. Uh, public transportation is, is stagnant, and in World War II, 50% of people who lived in urban areas rode public transportation, uh, but it has currently come to 2%, and here in Pinellas County, we're at between 1.5% and 2% of our neighbors that rely on public transportation to get to work, and this is our public bus system. You're looking here at a $650,000 bus, uh, and we have uh, uh, many of these. There's, there's 200 buses in the fleet of PSTA. Um, and I think about 20% right now are these, and they are being switched over to these $650,000 buses. Now, PSTA operations are currently subsidized, thinking about Disney. Um, what we have here is that, that the operations, you know, of a budget, you've got the operations budget, you've got the capital side of the budget. The operations are 75% subsidized, and um, here we have, uh, sorry, how'd I get that? <laughs> there we go. Um, this is the federal and state grants are 22%. The passenger fares, every time someone gets on, they are paying roughly 22% of the cost of the operations of PSTA. Advertising, 3%. This is the crux of the matter, is ad valorem property tax. This is the tax on our homes in Pinellas County. Represents 53% of the operations budget for a total of 100%. In 2014, the operation budget was $63 million, and it was up 5% over 2013. Now, plus the capital budget, that is an additional $28 million. So PSTA currently has a budget of $92 million a year. If you divide that by the number of annual rides, 
that would be a cost per ride of $7 per ride. Now, that's not per person, that's per ride. And the average fare by the rider for that ride is 91 cents. So we're currently subsidizing $6 out of every $7 for per each ride. So the total system is 87% subsidized. Now, this slide here, I'm going to run through quickly. This is only to talk about what our property value, our homes, did over the last decade. Here in 2002, the red lines is what I want to draw your attention to, is this is what our property, our house, what happened to our houses over, the, over that crazy period of time, up to 2007. And right here is where we all thought we were rich, didn't we? I, I know I thought I was going to do a reverse mortgage on my house and just retire and live forever on my house. And, and then the bottom dropped out of everything, and this, our property values went down, and so did PSTA's income, as did the municipalities that depend on ad valorem tax. So then PSTA raised our, our ad valorem tax from 0.56 to 0.7305 uh, to try to boost their income back up. Now, the most that they can charge by statute is 0.75, so you can see that they're virtually at their cap. Now, during this period of time, PSTA built a $40 million facility on 34th Street, doubling their space and expenses. And if you haven't been there, it's quite extravagant. Um, and, and you should make the trip out there. I really never knew it was there, but it is a quite a, 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 quite a, a mega place. Uh, this is another way of looking at the ad valorem. The top in 2007 was $38 million a year. And you can see that as the economy started to drop, that their ad valorem portion of all of those various incomes dropped down to $26 million. Here's the property tax increase they did, boosted it back up. So they raised our sales tax, but still they continued to outspend their income. This is a PSTA slide. Most of the things I'm going to show you are PSTA's information that I have gleaned by going to the meetings. And this shows a 2002, the, the spending from 2002 forward. Here's 2007 when the bottom dropped out of everything. They, they started to slow down spending here. They did a lot of cutting. They, they, they laid people off, let people go, and then they got the property tax increase right here, and off they go again. This right here is November 2014. I did not put this line on here. This is how sure they're hoping that you're going to pass this sales tax increase. Now, the PSTA staff, this is the people. In 2004, you can see they had 535 staffs. They went up to 617 high. Then the bottom dropped out in seven. Again, this is a PSTA slide. It went down to here. Here's the tax increase. Now the hiring starts again. PSTA CEO Brad Miller has warned us that if a new sustainable funding, for funding source is not found, they're going to have to cut their services by 30% by 2016. So PSTA is at a crossroad. They have to transform at great public expense to you or fix the bus system. So the highly controversial $1 million green light campaign has been launched for the last two years. A million dollars almost, well, really over a million dollars of their money, of our money through their budgets have been allocated for various uh, uh, advocating for the campaign. Uh, and and the, uh, in fact, you may have seen where there's been an investigation yesterday that was launched into the green light Pinellas spending from PSTA. Now, in the PSTA plan is the increased bus and light rail, like Don dis, uh, uh, described. Um, but I think it's important because a lot of people think we're talking about this, which is a high-speed rail, and what we're talking about is this, which is basically uh, kind of like back to the future. Uh, the average speed on a light rail system like this, it is a surface system. Uh, I talked to a lady yesterday who, uh, let's see, she lived, I believe she said, in Michigan City before she moved down here, and she said these things were in the intersections, causing congestion all the time, going through the intersections. November, green light Pinellas, yes or no? It's a 14% increase in the Pinellas sales tax rate from 7 to 8%. The real estate property tax now, as I told you, is $32 million. The first year that they expect to collect this to be 2017, it'll be $148 million. And this is a graph to show you the, the enormity of what this really represents for those of you who may think, gee, this sounds like a good idea. Here is what they're currently getting in that portion of their budget, which from the ad valorem. Here is the new tax. Every year without sunset, it will be through infinity. And it will go up by a 3% increase every year is projected. They're calling it a tax swap. Uh, I, I just, it's incredible, incredible to me that that, that could be uh, the, the messaging on this. 
It's $148 million for $32 million is no swap. Revenue neutral would be a swap. And I asked to see the document that is the tax swap. This interlocal agreement does not exist, and, and it is not also in the referendum ordinance language. So there is nothing to guarantee that there will be a tax swap. The Pinellas County sales tax would be the highest in the state of Florida, which cannot be good for business. Then PSTA will seek to issue bonds and obtain federal grants and get us into debt by using this income stream. Now let's say that I went and got a new job for $100,000 a year and I wanted to buy a house for $400,000. I would go to the bank and I would take my $100,000 income and my bills, you know, my house payment, whatever, I mean my um, car, credit card bill, and, and present that as my income, my proof of income, so that I could get the $400,000. This is exactly the same situation. They're going to take the $148 million and they will get us into debt in our county, initially a billion dollars to start the capitalization to build this system out. Doing nothing is not an option, PSTA CEO Brad Miller said in September 2013, but this is based on false premises. Even Don said in his presentation that there's all these 200,000 people that are coming, but there's no proof of that. This is their brochure off of the Greenlight Pinellas website, and right here it says more than 200,000 additional people and 148,000 new jobs are expected in Pinellas County by 2040. In other words, we better get ready for all these folks, but it's not true. In the Times on February 16th, just a month ago, not even, what, three weeks ago, here is the population that is uh, expected in Pinellas County, and you can see that it is flat. Now, we even lost a Florida house seat. Do you remember that? In the last census, because we lost population in Pinellas County. Pinellas County is not growing. Hillsborough is growing. Pinellas County actually lost 23,000 people between 2000 and 2010. Another false premise is that there's record ridership. And every month now, they have started talking about the million, do a million rides a year. I mean a month, I'm sorry, a million rides a month on the buses. But how do they count bus riders? If I go to the mall and I have two transfers and then two transfers home, I'm counted as six rides. So it, that's standard, I suppose, on the industry. But the point is, is that when you hear a million rides, it sounds like, wow, that's a million people. No, it's not a million people. And of course, it's pretty much the same people that are riding and they're transferring. And so, of course, it, it sounds like a lot. But the numbers have not changed much in eight years. I went back and checked archives. They're not that much. They're pretty much remaining the same. Have you noticed the empty buses? Certainly, I see empty buses, sometimes three and four at a time in one intersection. Uh, with maybe two or three people on the buses. And the reason for that is this bus study. This was done last summer uh, for the first time in 20 years. They spent $700,000, had an independent company come and do a bus study. This is the 40 routes. The gray are the buses. The blue are the trolleys. The two here are green, are the two buses that go over to uh, Hillsboro. Here we have the five top routes that are so busy that they're almost dangerous. Uh, here then we have, you can see, that these routes are just non-performing uh, and should be, should be realigned. Uh, here you have two trolleys uh, that in many cases people are paying 50 cents to ride these trolleys. So this is an unaltered slide, PSTA, unaltered, non nothing has been added. The top five local routes account for 46% of the system ridership. The trolleys account for another 13%. So combined, this accounts for 60% of the system ridership. Empty promise to the suffering but riders on the few overcrowded routes is 65 more percent more bus service with green light. But that too is just a promise. It's not guaranteed in writing. And reducing the proposed bus expansion is an early remedy listed in the Ernst & Young report on the financial feasibility. They list it right there that if they get into cost overruns, cut back on the bus expansion. False premise connects to Tampa. There is no rail to Tampa. There's no plan to have a rail to Tampa in the 10-year Pinellas. Uh, Greenlight Pinellas plan. Also, bus rapid transit, you saw in Don's slide where it said bus only on the street. Now um, they're, they're denying that there's going to be uh, 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 what they call exclusive use lanes. Uh, but you, you, as you can see, I have the same slide. This slide used to be on their uh, website. I believe it's been taken down now, and it says bus only because people do not like the idea of losing lanes on our roads to transit to buses and to trains. 
Now, light rail subsidy per, per ride here at PSTA, $7 we're paying uh, for a bus tra ra uh, subsidy. Charlotte for rail, nine mile, nine mile is $15.45. Every time somebody rides that rail, they're paying $2, and the, the taxpayer are paying $15.45. Houston, 1628 for seven miles. Minneapolis-St. Paul, $21.34 for a 12-mile line. Phoenix, $32.73 for a 20-mile. Greenlight Pinellas, 24 miles, and I'm sure it will be different here, huh? The Charlotte Observer, just two weeks ago, cash-strapped city state officials seek private dollars for public projects. Mecklenburg County leaders struggle to find a way to pay for $5 billion worth of unmet transportation project in the CAS 2030 plan. And who did Charlotte's financial projectors in 1997? Ernst & Young. The Charlotte mayor last week was arrested uh, for bribery, extortion, and corruption charges, a peddling permit influence peddling along the rail lines. True story, the FBI had been following him for two years. In Pinellas, we have just no need. We have now got this new uh, uh, gateway court, uh, connector, the toll road, that Governor Scott just brought to our door. Uh, we have 19 almost finished. We're going to, so this is going to be a huge, you're going to be able to go from the Sunshine Skyway Bridge all the way north of Countryside without a stoplight. And this is going to start in 2017 and it is not going to do, have any impact on, on our taxes. This is going to be paid for by some from Penny for Pinellas and also some from an over, overage of the FDOT budget for 2013. And in fact, uh, Senator Brandy said he wants to steer our conversation away from light rail and all the huge costs of a light rail system. We need to save the bus system for those that depend on public transportation and not start taxing them. We need to fix the 30% of the budget and the staff and the low performing routes that I pointed out now, and they can do that now. It's called the no new revenue scenario in the bus study. Just so you know what it's called. It's called, if it fails, then here's what we have to do, and we have to do it quickly. They already know what to do. And it's called the no new revenue scenario. Manage competition. If they can't take $92 million and take care of the public, the 1.6% of the folks here in the county that need high frequency, clean, dependable, safe transportation, then I think we should put it out to private bid. And by the way, these are available at $144,000 apiece, and there's so many routes that you could use $144,000 connectors. Thank you. Well, we've heard a lot of information. We've heard a lot of information tonight, um, and I, um, I do want to get to the audience, but we decided uh, by mutual consent that we were going to let each of the two presenters ask each other a question. They presented a very different picture. Um, and so we're going to ask uh, Mr. Ewing to ask Ms. Hazleton a question, and then she will ask him a question. We'll repeat it, and then we'll get to the audience. Mr. Ewing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oliver. Um, Barbara, in your uh, presentation, you talk about ride costs being 91 cents. Mm -hmm. um, I know that when I've ridden the bus, it's two dollars a ride or four fifty for an entire day. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious where you got the ninety-one cent average fare. From Mr. Miller. True. Sure. <laughs> Both of us are correct. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, the, then the whole answer. So the is average is ninety-one cents. After the subsidies and the, and the and the discounts for like Medicaid, it averages out to ninety-one cents, and I got that number from Mr. Miller's one of his talks. Okay. And then uh, second question, also budget related. Um, <clears throat> you talk in, towards the end of your presentation there about a $92 million budget if we don't move forward with the 1%, correct? Did I understand that slide correctly? You talk well, about a $92 actually, million budget. Well, actually, that's an interesting budget. question, Don, because the only part that would go away would be the $32 billion. The rest of it would still be intact. So it would really, they would still have $60 billion, a million, excuse me, $60 million plus the $148 million. Um, you understand that? No. Okay. Does, does the audience understand that? <laughs> Remember in this presentation where there's all the different parts of the operation budget and the $32 million was the was the ad valorem tax, 
Well, the rest of those state and federal grants, the passenger fares, all of that will still be coming in, right? Mm -hmm. All we're talking about is the ad valorem portion of the tax. They want to take away the 32 million and replace it with 148 million, which is the sales tax. So, the, and then that would be added to the remaining of the, of the, of the numbers uh, that would not be impacted. Questions? Um, okay. I've asked a couple of times, I sent you emails, Don, to come and speak to the North County Neighborhood Council after Greenlight was there two weeks ago, and you have not responded to my request uh, as the president of the North County Neighborhood Council, and I wonder why you have not responded to that unless I missed your, your email, and if I did, I, I Apologize. Oh, absolutely not. I apologize for not responding. Um, that evening, you're, you, you showed up at our meeting along with about eight folks that asked a lot of questions and presented basically your facts there to the audience. And I felt that that was your presentation in a nutshell. So I didn't, I actually did not respond to you. I apologize for that. It's not very courteous to not do that. But I felt that that was your opportunity to speak that evening. I, the, I was only the, a citizen that night making sure. a comment from the chair. Uh, so um, I, I asked for a presentation such as this in equal time. So. I, I promise you all will respond to you and we can get together and talk about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A second question. Um, can you produce the interlocal agreement that is the number one promise of the green light plan known as the tax swap? Absolutely not. That is something that the county commission is working on today. They are responsible for drafting that. That is something that, if I understand correctly, will be out before the November referendum or will be agreed upon between the county and the cities before the November referendum. So they are in the process of developing that and putting it into case. I'm sorry? I don't know. You'll have to ask the county commission. They're the folks responsible for developing that. Okay. This is a good time to break in as moderator. Um, because we're going to have some ground rules. Right. We, uh, and we want the it. audience uh, to question the panelists. We want this to be a free and open discussion. The Institute staff will be roving around um, the, uh, the digitorium with microphones, um, and then I'll call on folks to, to end, uh, ask questions. Um, these are to be questions, not statements. We're not making long statements here. As a matter of fact, there's a, a question to be asked within 45 seconds. Um, if not, a bell will ring. And we'll move on to the next question, uh, because this is all about trying to get information out to the audience. Um, we, will, <clears throat> we will also uh, please not make statements, try to wind things up. Um, the, um, and as I said, we will call on folks one at a time. So uh, yes, <clears throat> please, sta please stand up. Remember, we are recording this, so we do want to hear your question loud and clear, and so everyone in the audience can hear it, and then address it to one of the, the uh, presenters or the other. Uh, I have said that if, if the other presenter wants to, wants to chime in, we want them to do that. One other caveat, um, if there's a highly technical question or there's a question that one of the, one of the panelists wants, one of the uh, presenters wants to call on somebody to answer a technical question, we will do that. It's only to answer a technical question in no more than 45 seconds, no speeches. Uh, so that'll be another thing that's presented because this is all about trying to get as much information out to as many people as possible. Sir, your question. I've just got a question on your blue slides blue. Where, you, where you talked about light rail costs and some of the ones that were presented. There was no documentation as to where the facts came from. They were just up there. Which, which slide was that? Well, your cost per mile, for example, where you had Charlotte, et cetera, et cetera, in the various cities, uh, Milwaukee or Minneapolis or whatever it was. Uh -huh. You just put it up there without any reference to any uh, facts and figures. Okay. Why was that? Well, I, I will get the answer for you for that. I have stacks of documents up here, okay? And I have that, I believe, with me. Well, you presented without adequate documents. I mean, these aren't things I figured up. These are things that I've researched and gotten the, gotten the answers for. Mm -hmm. So here it is. Uh, so Rail subsidies. This is from the Federal Transit Administration's National Transit Database. Could we get a copy of that or take a look at it? Well, you can go to their website and get it. If you got That's it. That's where I got it. It'd be very easy to take a look at. Huh? It would be very easy to take you a look at You can take a it. picture of it with your cell phone. Okay, very good. Gonna... I think we have an answer. Let's move on to our next yeah, question, thank you. please. I believe, Shantae, you have a question over there. Yes, can I hold it? No. 
Okay, so this question is for uh, Don Ewing. As you know, those of us who are opposed to this plan, the rail portion is a bit like catnip. I grew up using transit. I'm not opposed to transit, but I'm sure you saw the article in the Times that talked about self-driving cars coming in four to eight years. It's gonna change land use completely. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, and my dad worked in signal engineering his whole life, so I'm not opposed to rail. It seems to me that this idea of drawing a rail line is ideologically driven. It's like we're gonna have a rail line which is inflexible, you can't move the stations once you're there, and like Ms. Hazelden said, billions in debt. Why is there this tremendous focus on rail? That's where most of the money's going. Uh, good question, and not being a transit expert, I'll try and answer that for you. Um, in most of the last decade or so, um, uh, other cities who have ventured into this quagmire, I'll just be politely putting, of providing, a, building a transit system in, in the areas. Um, light rail apparently is one of the chosen options in metropolitan areas that are wide, or spread out, that allow in a higher density environment the ability to move people back and forth in a cheaper fashion. And over time, from what I understand from the PSTA numbers, um, provide a better, cost per mile than the, uh, and I may be misquoting that, but they, they were better off and they were easier to move. And the fixed guideway is, is something that has two, part, two bonus parts to it. One is that, yes, it is a fixed guideway, and just like the CSX tracks today that move freight in and out of our county, they are going to be in place. The positive benefit of that is with a fixed guideway system like that and the infrastructure that's involved in going and putting that in place, it's, things will happen around that. If you just put a bus system in there and you say, okay, we're going to run down this road, pick up people and go all the way down there, and if that route didn't work out, there is a possibility that that could move, and if folks, if developers did infrastructure there, people moved there, and all of a sudden that wasn't a viable route, as Barbara pointed out in the slides there, there are routes that are not going to be as highly dri uh, ridden as others, then it, since it's not a fixed guideway, it could be moved. So I think the advantage of fixed guideway is that it, provides an economic development engine, and it provides a place for people to be able to live, work, and play. Can I have an answer to that? Uh, yes, we're gonna let, we're gonna let folks, if the, if the other presenter wants to have a response, we're gonna let them do that. Thank you. Um, I think that, you know, if there's one thing that I haven't really um, uh, covered in, in my presentation that is really missing, it is the discussion about density, uh, population density, and, and that is probably one of the biggest problems with this whole plan is that we do not have the, the, the density per mile uh, that justifies such a, such a system. And basically it's gonna go from one low density area to another low density area. And, and that's just a fact. I mean, we have 3,300 roughly people per square mile in Pinellas County. And, and this is, you know, this is just cause this is the one I can remember because uh, there's a, obviously all kinds of numbers in between. Uh, but New York, for example, is 50,000 people a square mile. So population density is huge. And then also there's, there's studies out, I just was reading one the other day, that uh, high level gold, you know, BRT lines creates growth cheaper. Uh, and and uh, th that's the bus rapid transit. So um, econ economic development will grow around BRT lines, um, uh, which are buses that go faster and stop less often um, at, at, at far millions and millions of dollars less per, per stop. Them than light rail, which cannot be moved. I'm going to allow one response. We, 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 this could get long, but go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to um, uh, address a couple of points you just said there. Uh -huh. You said that this rail system would travel from two low density, one low density area to another low density right. area. Um, last time I checked, the county quotes that Pinellas County is the highest density uh, county in Florida. Um, number one, number two, it's going. The rail line is specifically designed to go from the two is high density areas, which is downtown St. Petersburg to downtown Clearwater through Largo, Pinellas Park, et cetera. So it's, it's purposely designed to go from and to and through the highest density areas in the county. Okay, the fact that we might have the highest density in the state of Florida uh, does not really play into this because that density still does not um, warrant a rail system. Um, so okay. let the record show density is an issue. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. <laughs> the next question, please. <laughs> and that happens to be kind of the, along the lines I am thinking because when I first thought of this, saw this, I've been in the um, mortgage business since 1981, so I have an interest in single-family residential housing. 
And a lot of your, your pretty pictures in, in Disney, and if you build it, they will come, d d address our single family residents in the area. What's, when we build our community, your, your uh, community development plan that was shown in there, what's gonna happen to our single family homes as we um, move, put an immovable thing on there, an immovable path on there? What happens to those single family homes? And then my next question being in, in the mortgage business for so long was, what about eminent domain? Okay, as you come and you build this, my, th my question is, what, how much space are you gonna need on each side of that track? I heard Where the are bell. those people gonna go? I heard go? the bell, and we have two questions. Well, then we'll take the two questions. One is single family housing, and the other is eminent domain. And I assume that's for Mr. Hewing. And I'm gonna defer answering that because I am not an expert in either of those areas. Um, I, can, I, I am not, I'm sorry. And I'd have to defer the eminent domain question to Pinellas County. Um, and the only thing I can tell you is that in working with Pinellas County Commission and the Bob uh, LaSala, who's the county administrator, there, and, and we've actually had some in North County, some questions about rezoning and, and um, land use issues that could potentially have involved eminent domain. The county specifically uses that as an absolute last resort if no other possibility exists to come up with a, a compromise. It was actually on Klosterman Road that was just turned from a two-lane road to a, uh, sorry, not Klosterman, Keystone Road. It was turned, it was an east-west road that was turned from a two-lane road into a, basically a four-lane divided road. There were two properties along that entire corridor that were in the way of the road. Um, and the county negotiated for a year or two with the folks to try and make sure that that was a fair and equitable change. I mean, I, I can't answer why or how good it is or anything. All I can tell you is the county is very good steward of whether or not they're going to throw you out of your house or not. That's, that's absolutely their last resort. And I can't speak to the other issue. I, I'm not an expert in that area. Again, I have to defer. I don't, I'd have to ask somebody from PSTA. I, again, I am, I am an advocate for this program. I'm not a PSTA nor bus Can or mass transit. PSTA to respond? Yeah, I'll respond. We, we'd, like, we'd like for PSTA, to, is, is there someone from PSTA that can respond to the technical question very briefly? And then we want Barbara to be able to respond as well. Yeah. The, 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 uh, the audience, please refrain from, uh, from uh, uh, outbursts. The, th this is not an outfair, unfair advantage. And if we can have anyone on any side who Barbara would like to have to speak to a particular technical issue, I think it's important for the audience to try to get as much information. If, if Barbara challenges it or someone wants in the audience to challenge it, that would be fine. We're trying to, I believe, answer this, this lady's question. Um, you know, we all have seen that New Yorker cartoons, my facts, your facts, true facts, false facts. We're trying to get as many facts out on the table as possible. So I'm, I'm going to ask that we give a very brief response to that question, and Barbara, you'll have a chance to respond to it if you'd like. Fred? Uh, the majority of the right-of-way for the proposed rail system is in public right-of-way in those areas. As Don said, we also, in addition to county requirements, have to follow federal requirements to essentially make eminent domain acquisitions the last resort. We have to offer the appraised value of any any land. But Thank you. Okay. Barbara, did you have a response? Yeah, um, a couple of things. Uh, I, I, um, I think it's important for folks to realize that over time what this is designed to do is to force people to live around these rail stations in high rises and, and to increase dis density. That is where this, what this is about, is increasing density and, and living and shopping and, and working and so on and so forth and, and, and really uh, narrowing down your territory. Uh, Americans aren't used to that. Uh, we're used to having a big territory. Uh, so I wanted to say a couple things. First of all, this is from the National Association of Realtors and 82%, this is brand new, hot off the press from their annual survey, 82% of Americans overwhelmingly prefer to live in a detached home. Okay, so nothing's changed there. And, and then the other things I would say is that I believe there's a big discussion about eminent domain on Haynes Road. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, you've been very patient. You, you have the next question. Yeah, thank you. My question is to Don Ewing. Um, I wonder if you have studied what the county administrator has been saying about Pinellas County having a $40 million budget deficit by, I think it was 2030. So where would you prefer? I'm community oriented and minded, and I'm worried about how we're gonna maintain what we have with the light rail 
that will be sucking in all the funds. Um, what's your opinion on that? Um, great question, and, and the economics of county and city governments, national governments for that matter, is at the mercy of the economy. Um, I think this really boils down to we're, we're talking about getting a separate funding source. Um, the amount of money that the county relies on is primarily from property tax, um, and they're at the mercy of, and they've gone through, as all of us have, a, a huge recession where they had to cut back. I'm not aware, I have not followed the county to see what their projected budget uh, scenarios are for the coming years, but that money would be in no way associated with this particular funding source for the, uh, the enhanced transit. It's, it's coming from a sales tax and the property tax is going away, so if, if Pinellas County is, is budget is going to decline because of property tax, the, P, the new funding source for the enhanced uh, transit system would be not affected by that. It would be in its separate source. Thank you, Barbara. Any? No. Uh, that gentleman over to my left, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, St. Pete College first for hosting this forum. We appreciate it. And this question is for Ms. Hazelden. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to know what, the, what your solution is to reduce the amount of uh, single rider cars that commute tens of, tens of thousands of, uh, or tens of thousands single rider cars that commute hourly on public trans, um, publicly subsidized roads. Well, I think what the people of Pinellas County want to know is how we're, what we're going to do about single rider buses. Uh, and, and double rider buses. Uh, Don, did you have a response to that? No. Um, uh, well, we're going to try to go back and forth. We have two folks with Mike, so Shantae. And, 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 and Shantae, and, uh, you try to move around the room. We want to try to get as much participation as we can. We're going to try to get, we have quite a bit of time. We're going to try to get as many questions as we can. Yes, Shantae. Hi, this is a question for Don Ewing. I just, um, it seems like you might be talking out of both sides of your mouth a little when you say that the rail is going to serve these busy, densely populated areas and connect these uh, already thriving business sectors, and you're going to go along this route where everybody already lives, and yet you're saying there's going to be all this growth and new jobs and things built in the same place. So you can't have both. So which one is it? <clears throat> Thank you for your question. Um, it, it is both, actually, um, as odd as that sounds. And it's both, and I'll tell you why. On my way down here tonight, I came down um, Fort Harrison or Alternate 19, which runs basically along the coast through Clearwater, et cetera. The rail system that is proposed is running parallel to that area, because I rode all the way down from Clearwater to here. Um, it's, I say it's different because the rail system that will be put in place and that development that, was, that is, is proposed around those 16 stations is blocks, if not further, away from the current development. And usually, think about it, where tracks are today is not exactly the prime real estate that everybody wants to live near, so those are usually less densely populated, less um, uh, develop than areas today where they're in the prime area. I drove through Morton Plant Hospital. Morton Plant Hospital was all over alternate 19, but four blocks to the east, which is where the train would go, there was hardly any development there. So that's why it's both. It's those areas where the tracks will go through, through the county, are going to actually have development around them because they're going to be mostly isolated in many cases, other than the ones that go through the downtown areas. So I mean, that, that's how it ends up being both. So it's not both sides of my mouth. It's, it's true. You will get development in those new areas because people will have to migrate there in order to take the transit. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a, a report, just a, a statement out of a report called Cervero and Suscan from the Federal Transit Administration, report number TCRP-7. And this is simply a statement from it that I took that said, urban rail transit investments rarely create new growth, but more typically redistribute growth that would have taken place without the investment. And I sometimes will talk with people, and a lot of us here remember what happened in the 60s and the 70s when the malls came and the downtowns emptied out. It is a redistribution. So it's not new business. It's just that they move around. And, and so... Uh, People like myself who have a business, a brick and mortar business uh, that I've invested in, uh, which I, my business isn't coming into play, so don't think that that's my, my um, uh, reason I'm in this. I, I have no financial gain or, or, or dog in this race. Um, but as a business owner, 
that has made an investment, if I have my business and all of a sudden all of this, all of this money and, and messaging is driving people to go someplace else to shop on the rail, uh, that, that's just a redistribution and it's going to very much harm uh, the folks who have made an investment in our county over the, over the decades. Redistribution or new growth? A question. Okay. okay. Another question. A question for Don Ewing. Uh, if you don't know the answer, uh, or one of the PSD doesn't know the answer, I have the answer for you. Do, they know, <laughs> do you know what the population of the state of Florida will be in 2050? No. It'll be double the size it is right now. And if we don't get light rail and more bus service, those, uh, fr those electric cars that travel by themselves will be going nowhere. Just, just take the malfunction junction once in a while and see why we need light rail and more bus service. So what is your question, sir? No statements, just questions. I, yeah, I gave him the question, uh, Dr. Oliver. I asked him the question in the front. Oh, the, the, Did he the, know the, the population of Florida, what it was going to be in 2050? Uh, that, that's, you're on thin ice with that one, sir. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, but is there a, re, is there a response? Uh, uh, because, because one of the issues I think that we're, we're facing, and, and, and it came up in the last question, um, is, is this plan, mm -hmm. if passed, is it going to bring new growth to the county, or is it going to redistribute growth? Um, and, and so, the, obviously, that gentleman's question is, uh, his sense is that it will bring new growth. And so, what, what is your, res do you have a response to that? Do either one of you have well, a response to that question? Well, I think I already had it in my presentation, which is not my, um, my uh, it's not my findings, of, uh, and none of these things are my findings. Uh, and that is, again, I beg you to remember the slide that was in the Times a couple of weeks ago that shows Pinellas County. Now, we're not talking about malfunction junction. We're talking about Pinellas County tax increase. That's what we're talking about. And, and as far as Pinellas County is concerned, where we live, we have no projection of uh, growth in this county in, in, the, in the foreseeable future. Stagnant growth, and this is not my numbers, it's, it, it is, is what's projected. Okay, I believe the next question is over to, to my right. Yes, good evening. Thank, I'd like to thank everyone for being here tonight. I'd like to ask a, a question uh, also as a veteran. I'd like to thank everybody for being here tonight also. Now for the question. I want to talk about the red, white, and blue, and what does that have to do with this? Well, I'm from an organization, and I'm going to put on my correspondence hat to ask Don this question. Um, you said in your opening statement, uh, providing information, I don't know if you're you can uh, respond to this. Uh, maybe you could ask someone. Uh, it's not talked about. I think it should be talked about. We hear a lot about jobs, economic return to the community, and so on and so forth. Well, if I'm not mistaken, when we talk about a light rail system, I think it means a lot of tonnage of steel. Okay? Where is, I've asked these questions for months and I've yet to get any answers. I got a whole a lot, of, a lot of questions. Where is this steel coming from? America? Overseas? Where are the trains going to be made? In Florida? In America? Component parts? And the, also all the other component parts, electrical, et cetera, et cetera. I would like to have a commitment from the PSTA and Greenlight that all this is stamped, made in the U.S. of A. Thank you very much. Thank you for your passionate question. <laughs> it's a great question, and uh, I am going to defer that to PSTA to answer that because I have absolutely no idea where the trains or the tracks or anything else is coming from. But to, to go to your point that you have lots of questions, be happy to meet with you afterwards, uh, get those questions from you, get you in touch with folks at PSTA that can answer those questions for you. That part of what we do is trying to get answers for you. So I'm going to defer to Brad or somebody at PSTA to, if they can answer that. There's a federal law that requires us to have all the steel be 100% made in America, and the vehicles also have to comply with that law. Be in America. Right. I, I've lost track of who's the next question. I, I, I believe it's uh, you, David. Yes, yes, ma'am. Well, uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> My question is in regard to what this is supposed to all be about: gridlock. Okay. 
this is dealing with gridlock. Could you please explain to me how the light rail system is going to work with the bus system and eliminate some of our gridlock? I've lived here 20 years. I've seen Almerton torn up three different times, keep trying to widen the road, also Highway 19. I know a lot about the bus. Miss Barbara, how did you get here tonight? I drove my car and I, uh -huh. I got here from St. Pete in Anybody about 24 minutes. Anybody here ride a bus tonight? Good for you. I ride the bus every single day. Where you're getting this, no, Pinellas I, County? I'm, is, I'm sorry. We're, 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 uh, on both sides, correct. we're going we're gonna to try to keep statements to a minimum and keep the questions. But, yeah, but, I, but I believe you have a question, and that is the question is, 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 is it to Don, ma'am? Is it to Don? How, 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 is the, how is the system going to deal with gridlock is her question. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I believe that the goal and vision of enhanced transit systems is to get folks options and, and uh, other, uh, other abilities to take transit versus taking their cars. Um, anybody that's gone to the beach, wants to go from one part of the beach to another, can jump on a trolley and get to, uh, get to that. If you want to run, if you want to take rail or bus to go to the shopping center, uh, send your kids to the beach. So transit is really about options and to take single family dri or single drivers off the highways and give them options for transit um, to use, not, maybe not every day. Some folks will use it every day, but some folks will use it on occasion. I might use it when I travel and go to Tampa Airport, take that regional express bus that the green line's going across the bay and avoid those $20 a day parking fees at, at uh, TIA. So it's about options, it's about getting people off the roads and hopefully not expanding Almerton and US 19 mm -hmm. and the other roads, which my business is in countryside on US 19 and that project is, they've, I don't think they've got the, um, uh, the uh, service roads done yet, the one lane service roads in three years and it's projected to be 2017, I think, before that part's even done. So I live and breathe it. But you can only expand roads to a certain amount. You're going to run out of space at some point to accommodate the drivers. So you have to provide alternatives and educate folks to be able to say, hey, I can do this instead. And that's, I think that's how gridlock's going to be helped here. Obviously, the trains and buses will, will contribute to that. Thank you. Yes, Barbara? Yes, I just wanted to respond that it only makes sense that we would continue to work on the roads because 98% plus people uh, in Pinellas County use the roads. So, of course, we're, we have to continue to improve and work on the roads. Shante, I believe you're next. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Ewing, this is for you. Um, in Hillsborough in 2010, voters rejected the increase in tax, 58% to 42, and that's what's $1.7 million of money, most of it coming from well-connected real estate developers and others. But we knew who the donors were. Mm -hmm. No Tax for Tracks has released every donor name, every donor dollar amount. Will you, as co-chair, I believe you can have the ability to answer this question. Mm -hmm. As co-chair, will you commit to demanding from your board that they release the name of all your donors and all your donor amounts, or will you continue to hide behind Citizens United? Um, this is absolutely your lucky day. I get to answer this question, and the answer is that uh, the information you have is about a month or two old. The campaign has changed, has created a new entity that is the Pinellas County PAC that is fully transparent. We uh, abandoned the other, uh, the other 501c4. Um, it was for good intention, but it, it obviously was for the wrong result, and we recognize that as well, and we changed immediately. Um, you'll see our filings just right along beside Barbara's filings on the Pinellas County election website. You're welcome. And then the second thing, you talked about Hillsborough County's referendum in 2010, and, and you, you brought that up. And that's actually great, because the Pinellas County Greenlight Plan is something that is um, learned from that, uh, that effort in 2010. Um, it was a, it was probably, and I, I wasn't involved in it, but I did hear about it. I've lived here. Um, it was an effort that probably got started a little bit without a lot of basis in there. They didn't have a plan. They didn't have a, a budget. They didn't even have where the train was going to go. And they were asking voters to go out and approve a plan. Well, we know how that worked out with the Bigger Waters Flood Act. Congress approved in 2012 raising the flood insurance, or re redoing the flood insurance with the Bigger Waters Act, had no idea what the impact was going to be. All of a sudden now in 2014, when that impact is real and we found out that folks' flood insurance is going to go skyrocket, all of a sudden now they're going, ooh, I didn't know it was going to do that. So we did learn from that. And 
And the other part of that is that the Green Light Penthouse plan is well vetted, it is well designed, it has been being worked on for years and years and years. Many, many folks have looked at this. You can go today and look at the virtually the exact plan that will exist if the ballot language is passed. So there's no, there's no questions here. It, you, you've got a much better starting place, and I think we'll be able to provide a solution should the voters think it's a good idea. Yeah. Oh, uh, last point. I'm sorry, Barbara. I, I, I meant to say this. Um, and, and relating to that, if you noticed, uh, if you heard the news in the last couple of weeks, Tampa Mayor Buckhorn, um, in his State of the City address uh, about two weeks ago, or a week and a half ago, stated that transit is the biggest initiative for Tampa in the coming years. He committed that Tampa would move forward, in or wanted Tampa to move forward in 2016 to have their own referendum to bring transit to Hillsborough County. And he said, I strongly su suggest that everyone support the Greenlight Pinellas plan so this becomes a regional effort. Um, Barbara talks about the, the Hillsborough or the Howard Franklin connection to Tampa as a dotted line. It is a dotted line because it requires a regional solution in order for it to be viable. We are not Pinellas County. We are not Largo. We are not St. Petersburg. We're not Tampa or Temple Terrace. We are the Tampa Bay region and it's important that we are able to get around that entire region today in our future, have our kids have the ability to go to work in Tampa, come home and live in Pinellas County, and vice versa. So, thank you. Barbara, you want to follow up? Yes. Um, I would just say to that that, uh, you know, if, if, let's say, for instance, that I were elected as a Hillsborough County Commissioner, just use that as an example, I would be doing that for the people of, I mean, for a Pinellas County Commissioner. I would be representing the people of Pinellas. And so all decisions that would be made would be with regard to Pinellas and not to, I would not be being elected as a county commissioner, as, an, as this example, or the mayor of Tampa Bay region. I would be representing the constituency of the district that has been uh, laid out um, uh, for, you know, forever. So I have to tell you that I, I, um, um, I think Hillsborough does have growth. They have uh, challenges that they have to meet. Barrett Waters. I, I, that you know, we have the distinction, of course, here in Pinellas County of being the highest the highest impacted county in the entire country with regards to bigger waters, and this is this is a, a a story that has not played out yet, and we don't know what impact bigger waters is going to have on our county in the next five to ten to fifteen years. It could be crushing, and so at a time when we're looking at this and we have not got the need for this, this is a want. And, and at the time that we're looking at billions of dollars of, of debt for our county, you know, think of your own lives. I mean, you have to be so careful about the commitments that you make because something may be looming in, in the future. It is, it's a fact about bigger waters. So I think we have to, we have a big, big thing here to be considering. We need to be fiscally um, uh, careful here uh, we, we, uh, that we don't get ourselves into a double whammy of, um, property tax, I mean, uh, you know, the um, uh, cost overruns that are often associated. In fact, I'll close this just by saying that between cost overruns, high maintenance costs, and endless proposals for new rail lines, your costs will never end. It's, as soon as this rail line's done, it's going to be, what's the next one? It's going to be another referendum. It's going to be another tax increase. Just Shante, saying, and I've heard that at Shante, the meetings. Uh, Shante, I think uh, you have the next yeah. question. Is that correct? David. Uh, David? Mm -hmm. Thank you. This question is for Ms. Uh, Hazelton. Yes. You mentioned tonight that the typical bus ride is three buses. The typical rider, you mm -hmm. mentioned that in mm -hmm. your online videos. You said that Tuesday night in Gulfport as well. Mm -hmm. You also referenced a bus study done by a group out of San Diego. Mm -hmm. the results of that study showed that 88% of the rides on PSDA are one bus or two, which means only 12% are taking three buses. So you're saying the typical ride is three buses. Can you define typical and how you justify making that claim over and over again? Well, you know, I was, I'm, I'm quoting a meeting that I was at one day where the lady, the elderly lady, who has since passed away, unfortunately, um, she was talking about how she would, would leave her house and go to the mall. Uh, I think that I can also say I'm no expert in, in, in uh, transit, but I've learned a lot and uh, that these transfers 
do count as rides. And when I first heard that there was over a million rides a month, I thought, how can that be? There's only 900,000 people that live in the county. So to me, it was like this was, this was a million people. And then when I heard her get up and say, it takes me two transfers to get to the mall and two transfers to get home, and I went, bingo, that's six rides. All of a sudden, it made sense to me. And I think that the folks need to understand how this math works. Don? <clears throat> How many people in this room tonight think we have a great bus system? Can we get maybe four? Okay. We don't have a good bus system today, and is that, that is exactly the point, that we need to find some way to improve transit options for, our, for the residents of the county. Um, it's, it's important to move that process forward and find ways to do that. We have a couple of options. One is to approve the plan, this particular plan, which has been long in the works trying to come up. It may not be the best plan. I'm a business owner. I, 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 I rank things. I, I make decisions about businesses based upon you know, facts. This may not be the best plan, but it's the plan that's presented to us today. It's long thought about, well vetted. So we have, we have two choices the way I look at this. We can either figure out, we can either pass this plan and hope for the best and, and hope that that plan is, is viable. Sorry, don't, don't say hope for the best make sure this plan is viable and that it provides us with better transit options for the folks that would use it and folks that would grow to use it over time. Or we can not pass it and deal with the current budget numbers, which are the $32 billion, $36 million property taxes, and see what we can get for that. But I think all of us want better transportation options. It's just a question of what that is and how we move forward in the future. And today we're presented with Plan A or really no plan. So I, I think that's the choices you have to make in November. Chante, a question? Hi, can anyone tell me what the, what's the, the minimum population density that's needed to support a rail system that'll pay for itself? Um, I can't answer that. Um, I would have to defer to a transportation person. Do we have any? What's the, uh, Restate the question. Right. 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 Okay. Uh, uh, let's see if Brad can answer that for us. That there's no transportation system, road, bus, or any or light rail that pays for itself. I do know that the population density of Pinellas County uh, exceeds. Uh, many cities in cities in the United States that have um, have passenger rail uh, with with has more population density here than in other cities that already have it. Barbara, do you have, do you have a response to that, or anyone else have a response to that in terms of any studies that they know of that they'd like to cite? Well, I I I think that um, you know Charlotte. I think is a good example that the growth that they've had along the Charlotte line has been mainly apartments and and those of course are owned by big business people who have come in and, and they've been able to capitalize on that and so therefore they're creating density uh, through these apartments so that's the growth that they're seeing in Charlotte but um, as far as uh, Charlotte I already showed you that the, the subsidies on Charlotte I think it was $16 so if you have a family of four that wants to go to an event, downtown Charlotte, it's costing $60 to the taxpayer, and they're paying $8. So this is the kind of numbers that we're getting ready to vote on. I, I, I notice a lot of questions. We have 15 more minutes for questions, and then we're gonna let the two sides give a final three-minute review. So I'm gonna stop the practice of point-counterpoint. We're gonna have okay. a question to one to one of one or the other, and then we'll move on to the next question so okay. we can have okay. more questions asked. Yes, sir. Yes, I wonder if you, ma'am, would support this green light project if light rail was not part of the equation. Well, I think that's a great question. And um, I think the main thing, the, the, the ball that we have to keep our eye on is the people that depend on public transportation and, and, and what's gonna be best to serve that part of the, trans, the population at the best deal to the taxpayers. And that plan 
uh, could be the no new revenue scenario that the bus study has determined. It could just very well be that. And I think that that's a public discussion that needs to be had. Uh, but honestly, I think that needs to be had sooner. I think it needs to be had now and, and not go through the, the, uh, the millions of dollars that uh, are being spent uh, to get us to November. Um, I, the data has already been done. You know, the studies have been done. So uh, in answer to your question, I think that, uh, that, that the, you know, all the fact finding has been done, but nothing's, nothing's moving forward on it. They're just going to wait till November and see if they can get this through and, and go forward with the, and another thing I want to say is that uh, all this talk over and over and over again about this has been in the works for 40 years, 40 years, I, you know, I, I don't know what significance that part of this conversation has. It has never been on the referendum. And, and it has never, you know, just because it's been talked about among a handful of folks, trust me, it's been a handful of folks, and, and um, it is not something that has been hammered out over 40 years. They went through an alternative analysis uh, over 18 months last year ending up, so it's been a project that's been going on about three years. Another question over here to my right. That that density question, because our son and his family live in Hong Kong, and public transportation there is in great measure paid for as is a, a private entity. So I think you're looking at that kind of a density before it pays, and I think that's what this gentleman is asking before it can pay for itself. Uh, anyway, my question is this, you know, and I want to make a quick statement. And it wasn't long ago that I attended a uh, county commission meeting in which there was a very extensive presentation about poverty in Pinellas County. My question is for uh, Ms. Hazelton, and that is, what do you believe the impact of this sales tax increase will be on the poor and the middle class in our community? And that's addressed to Mr. Ewing? To is me. To me. She said to me. Uh, who's, who, who, who is that? Do? She said to me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's a known fact that a sales tax is a regressive tax and that it does impact the, the uh, elderly that are on fixed incomes and the poor. That's, that's the biggest impact that there is. And most of those folks, not all, uh, are not property owners. So this will be a brand new tax, a brand new burden for them. And I have to tell you, most of them have no idea this is going on. And all of a sudden, they're just going to have, a, have a, a new tax that they're dealing with that uh, when, you're, you know, when, you're, when you're poor or on a fixed income, uh, every penny counts. It does count. Next question. Hi, um, sir. Um, they always say follow the money. You've heard that lots of times. I'm seeing 30 million with this 1% going to 130 million or 148 million, a big jump. What I want to know is who has, who that is supporting this in your organization or with the PSTA um, is, is going to make out in this. The real estate developers, the property folks, who's going to make the money out of this? It's coming out of our pockets. That isn't currently being disclosed. We always find out about this stuff later. Oh, yeah, they made a bunch of money. Can you address that? Uh, I'd be happy to try, yes, sir. Um, public money is, uh, is very well guarded. Um, this particular 1% sales tax and the current penny sales tax um, comes through Pinellas County Commission and is managed through, funneled through them. In the case of the penny, they manage that money and that money goes to capital projects in Pinellas County for the last 20 or 30 years. In the case of the new penny that's being asked from you, um, that money will also funnel through the, the County Commission and go to PSDA and it's only for use by PSDA. All the development and stuff we talked about is all private investment once the rail system and the bus system is in place. Um, a lot of studies have come up and said that this type of system will bring businesses and younger people to the area. Um, I, I talked to a, a girl in uh, USF in St. Pete who had a car whose lease was up. She was talking to me during last summer's green light presentations and said, gosh, I wish this was in place already so I didn't have to renew the car, my car thing. It's the people that are going to use the, use the system and come into play that are going to help make it work. When people come, the developers will come behind them and hopefully build 
uh, communities or build businesses around them to help it. So no, no developer is going to get any money unless they're bidding on the, on the contract. I'm sorry. The developers and the guys who, the, con the companies who are going to build the rail, they're going to get the hundreds of millions of dollars, those guys are already in line. They already have, the, they already purchased the property on the line or have an influence in where a line is going to go. How do, I, as, a, as, a, as a, a resident, I don't, you guys know who these, who these guys are that already own this property and are set up for development. Who are um, I, I personally don't know the answer to that. Um, I know they build rails, yes, so I'm, I'm sure they have an interest in it. But, you know, that, that's a contract bid process. That's very much public records. People that bid, businesses that build on or bid on government projects have to meet all kinds of sunshine requirements and criteria. Uh, from what Brad said, most of the rail line is on public right-of-way today, and only some smaller portion of it, less than, less than the majority, is in private areas where people will have to be, have to sell their property to, to the rail line. So. We need to move on oh, the, to the, the next question because we're almost out of time, and I want to try to get as many questions as we can. The endorsers are folks. We need to follow. It. We need to follow up with that question. I understand. Yes, sir. All right. I want to bring this back to what it's really about: replacing the ad valorem tax with a sales tax. Right. How are you going to guarantee to these people that the ad valorem tax is going away, since the county commission? nor the PSTA has the authority to do that. That has to be done at the state legislature. What you're saying with an interlocal agreement is that you're just making it go dormant and now you can bring it back at any time when you see it necessary to raise more f funds for what you're gonna have in shortfalls or overruns. Okay. You done? Okay, yeah, sorry I wasn't sure if you were going to continue there. Um, I spoke with the chairperson of the Pinellas County Commission about that very issue. Um, we've had that question a lot. The answer is yes. Unfortunately, the state legislature chose not to uh, sun allow PSTA to sunset the current property tax. Um, it was in the legislature, I think, last year or year before, and it, the governor wouldn't sign it. So in spite of that, the county commission, in the interlocal agreement from Commissioner Seal herself, Chair, Chairperson Seal, said that the interlocal agreement will be structured such that since the county commission is going to funnel the money through them and then it goes to PSDA, that if PSDA should sometime in the future choose to raise that millage back up, because unless the state makes it go away, they potentially could do that, that the county commission would reduce their funding from the sales tax by that amount of money. The governor has to sign it. Right. I agree. Totally agree. And no, that's not true. That's not true. It's not possible. According to County Commissioner Seal, and I'm sure the, the commission will follow through, and you can review that when the interlocal agreement's in place prior to November, that will be in there so that that is not a possibility to be able to allow them to do that. And if they do, that funding will come back. It will go away. Can I comment so. on that? Yeah. May I comment on that? Did, did, I'm sorry. Can I comment on that? Yeah, you, you, uh, we can comment. We've never had one of these forums. I was concerned that we'd run out of time for questions. We're going to run out of time for questions. So let's, let's no, try I, to be, as, I, I let's try to be lightning round no, as we can. Go ahead. Go ahead and ask no, other people's I, 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 believe he's, I believe he's answered the question. Yes. Well, let's get, we'll get three or four more here. questions in. I know there's... More and more hands up. Yes, David. Oh, they've, they've tried to make the rounds. It's, it's difficult. Good, e Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Pemberton. I'm a former graduate of St. Pete College and a current master's student at the, the University of South Florida getting my MPA. And I have a question for you, Don. I'm wondering, what's the tar we've talked a lot about density, we've talked a lot about who's going to use this, but we haven't talked about who's the target demographic, how are we going to increase ridership, how are we going to make this more effective to reduce drunk driving, you know, make, this, make the city more accessible for students and the elderly, who are we targeting here and how are we going to get this message out to them and get ridership up? Um, again, I, I'm not part of the implementation process, just the, the pre-stuff, but from the, the things I've heard, the answer is they're targeting um, folks who 
would ride the bus today, which a lot of it is, is your generation, students, 20-something, uh, 30-somethings, that prefer an urban lifestyle, that like to live near their work, that rather not have a car. That's part of the demographics. Part of the demographics is older folks that either have to give up their cars or choose not to drive. That's also part of the demographics. And yes, it will be a time period that the ridership will build. Day one, when the system opens in 2024, I believe, and the rail system is active, there won't be as many riders as there will be in year two, year three, year four. It takes a while for these things to build up. For you to say to yourself, gosh, you know, I've heard about this for months and years, and, and I can get to XYZ on the rail. And all I got to do is drive 10 minutes, park my car, get on this air-conditioned thing, and get to my destination and back in a timely fashion. So I'm hoping that, I, I don't know what the plan is for the marketing for that, but I believe that it will, and is shown in other areas, to grow over time. Shante? Yes. Is it not true that this rail system can be re replaced by a total bus transit system? Bus transit system alone yes. without the rail can do the same thing with the same ridership capability with all at half the cost. I don't know about the cost aspect of it, but yes, bus rapid transit only system or a bus only system is an option. It is an option. Um, the an alternatives analysis that Barbara referred to that has been going on for a few years, yes, not 40, but over the last, I think since 2009, um, it is something that vetted various different avenues. I mean, it, it, was, it was well vetted. There was a BRT only option they looked at. There was various configurations of rail, bus only, where can we put it, how can it be vetted. There was a lot of thought and effort given into it by a lot of people that was an option. Um, the folks that chose this particular plan and, and decided to move forward with it thought the light rail option would be better. I'm going with the current plan in place. The only other option is for us to vote this down, go back through that study process, come up with a different plan, and present it to the voters again, because the 0.75 cap that they have for property tax won't be enough to, to do those kind of things. David? Barbara, I, I thought I heard you a few minutes ago that the mysterious money behind the Green Life of Pinellas are going to be building apartment complexes. I assume they're not going to be for free, so I guess what you're saying is that this is going to bring more people and more jobs to the area. The second question is, those folks that you're talking about are going to be so harshly impacted, the lower income residents of our county. It costs about $10,000 a year to own a car, between the purchase of the car, maintenance, upkeep, gas, those things. Those people now will have a way to get to their job every day, on time, every day. Could you comment on those, please? Okay, who are you asking to comment on that, sir? Barbara. You know, I, I think, I, I have to say that $10,000 a year to own a car uh, is, is uh, uh, very, um, it, that, that, that's, a sliding, that's a sliding thing. It depends on what car you own and, and if you pay, you know, if you pay cash for it. I mean, there's many ways to, excuse me, you've asked the question. I've given the sources let's, on everything let's, that let's I'm Let's ask citing. a question and let it be answered. Sorry, yeah. Barbara, go ahead. Uh, what was the first part of the question? What was the first part of the question? The first part was that you, you said that the secret money behind Greenlight Pinellas is going to build apartment complexes. Oh, no, I didn't uh, say. Did I say the secret money behind Greenlight Pinellas? I don't think I said that. I think what I said was is that the, 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 uh, the growth that, it, that they're seeing in Charlotte along the rail, which is roughly about 40% of the rail is experiencing uh, some significant uh, uh, construction, and it's mainly apartments. And so granted that those apartments would be owned by developers that would be a very good investment for them. But I wanted to piggyback because you bring up a fantastic point, and that is, is that not only are we talk about subsidizing the rail, but those projects get subsidized too. So it's a subsidized a double layer of subsidy by the taxpayers to attract those people to come in and to build these But these, those new these residents units. are going to require new jobs, so it's all uh, about we're, growth. We're, this is back and forth. We're going to have time for about two more questions. Yeah. So, Shante, one more, and then David, one more, mm -hmm. and then we're going to wrap up by letting the panelists. I'm sure they will stay around afterwards to address your individual questions, but in the interest of getting out on time, which we promised to do, two more questions, a wrap up, and then we'll take that final poll. Shante. Don, since the Seattle Light Rail was instituted, the neighborhoods around the rail uh, stops have shown much higher crime rates and very few small businesses. Uh, how would that be different here? 
I don't know that I can answer that question. I've only been to Seattle once, but I, I would assume that in more urban settings, I lived in St. Pete for about six months last year, and I was literally downtown right off Beach Drive. Um, there was more crime there than when I lived in East Lake, um, in, a, in a community up there. So I would assume that's a logical statement, that urban areas are going to have more crime. My car was not broken into because I left it unlocked one night, but I went down to get in my car in the morning in my parking garage in the condo, and there was somebody's cell phone in there that was not mine. He had pillaged through and in fact taken anything that was loose. So sure, that's going to happen. Did it prevent me from living in downtown St. Petersburg? No, it made me lock my car, though, every night instead of leaving it unlocked, because I was used to not having to lock it in, in a more suburban setting. So I think that's true, but I don't think that's a deterrent to doing it. I think that's, a, that's just a, a fact of life. People don't not live in cities because of, of urban crime. It's obviously higher. Look in the newspaper. The zip, they always do the crime reports in the, in the Times. In the area I used to live in, there was three or four. In, in the area that I lived in in St. Petersburg, there were two and a half pages every week of burglaries. One last question yep. and then the wrap up. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just want to say I haven't heard from many of us, but I am a writer, PSTA, and a student at St. Petersburg College. Um, I ride the bus constantly. And, um, you know, let me tell you, um, the last time I was in Disneyland, I never, ever saw a driver pick on somebody for being on Medicaid. I was actually able to get in touch with the CEO and the president of Disney. Brad Miller still won't talk to me, but the question that I have is actually, um, you guys say 57 minutes on this track. Well, I'm just curious because when I ride the bus every day, we have wheelchairs and we have walkers. Um, with 16 hubs, I mean, are you guys just flying right through these things? I mean, you guys are putting all this information, but are you really looking into it? I mean, as someone from the county, I can assure you, I get to school from North County to South County just fine. The times that I miss, it's because PSTA has mismanaged their routes and they're not paying attention to what's going on. So I think the question was, repeat it for me, please. The question was, you say 57 minutes oh, on right. the line. What, right. what, what are you doing about the disabled people? Because I know it takes quite a long time to load everybody up. And if you're talking about the growth you're talking about, mm -hmm. it's going to take a while to load these hubs. If mm -hmm. you have 16, let's talk five minutes a hub. Let's talk three sure. minutes a hub. Sure. Where's this 57 coming from? Are you guys just making up numbers still, or what's going on? Um, I doubt if those numbers are made up, but I, and I can't answer directly where the 57 minutes came from. It was part of the alternative analysis study that I, the, one of the slides I had up there, that was pre-PSTA's numbers, those were the alternatives analysis. But what I can tell you is in having ridden transit in other cities, light rail styles transit, it's a much quicker, easier on and off. I mean, Atlanta Airport, let's talk about that. You go from the airport onto a train, it takes you to the rental car garage or to MARTA, and you get off. Those are same level, you're wheeling right on if you're in a wheelchair. You're moved right to a wheelchair ramp right there. It takes as little time as walking on as a person. Yes? I, yes, no? I, think, I think there may be difference, a difference of opinion on this. And unfortunately, I don't think we're going to settle that in the next <laughs> three minutes. It is something, though. PSGA is here. Let's have a conversation. Let's have follow-up conversations on a number of these points. In some cases, we just raised issues, uh, and it gives us an opportunity to follow up later. But we're going to end this program by asking each of our... Uh, let's give them a round of applause first. <laughs> Last, let's ask each of our uh, presenters, and please with the bell in the front, uh, no more than three minutes to, to sum up <clears throat> uh, your case. Uh, for, for or against this proposition, and we'll start with uh, Mr. Ewing. Thank you very much for coming tonight and taking time out of your evening to get educated about um, the Greenlight Pinellas plan. It's important for us to make informed decisions when we go to the ballot. Discourse is great. I, I enjoy talking about this. I was talking to Tom Rask, uh, who is one of the opponents. It's important for us to have this dialogue. It's important for us to vet these questions and find out where the answers are. This, I don't believe in my involvement in, in looking at PSTA from the private uh, funding campaign, nor in any of the studies that I got involved in earlier on, did I see people trying to mismanage or create bad ideas. I think these are all being done for good reasons, for the benefit of 
perceived value and perceived need in the, in, the, uh, in the residents. It's important that we continue to look at this, understand it, know what it brings us, and not make partial decisions based upon partial facts. Um, if you look at the entire Green Light Plan, you notice tonight I talked about as being easier access to work, options for transportation, a fair tax if we have to increase our budget for a transit system, and, a, and an engine, a catalyst, to help drive economic development in Pinellas County. Those are things that are positives about this plan or any enhanced transit plan. Um, it, it, I think the, the other message that I'd like to leave you with is it's more than a light rail plan. It is not a light rail plan. It is a transit system for Pinellas County that hopefully will connect regionally and, and make it more viable. But it's a transit system. It includes buses. It includes uh, train uh, stations develop around that area. It improves sidewalks. It talks about bicycle paths to get to the stations. It's park and rides so you can have a place to park your car to get on the, the transit system. So it's everything wrapped up into one pretty package that says, hey, this is a way to improve our county and to give folks options here to be able to, um, to have available thing, uh, um, options to be able to get to a particular area. It's for our young people. It's to help bring my son, who's at college in Tallahassee today, I hope that when he gets done with his degree, I hope he gets a degree first. If he get, if he, assuming he does get a degree, I hope he comes back to Pinellas County to find a job. Um, one of the things this, this plan can help do is either bolster businesses that are here to hire more people that would come here, or it would allow my son to come back here and have a job in, in this area. So it's that kind of people that we're looking to help help out not hurt, um, and it is for the better good. It, it, this, is, this is something for Pinellas County. It's for you in your home. It's for you in your car. It's for the folks that drive 19. It's for the displaced businesses. It's for everything to be able to have something that we can be proud of and that helps connect us through, through the area. Um, I'll leave you with a final note that we honestly believe, the campaign honestly believes, that this is a good plan. It's important for us to look at it, understand it, and then make an informed decision on November 4th. I ask that you vote yes for green light on November 4th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. <clears throat> and, um, and your wrap up, Ms. Hesley. Thank you. Can you imagine what it would be like in Pinellas County or any place in the, across the country if we did not have a public transportation system for those that, that depend upon it. I was thinking about it this afternoon when I was driving out here uh, about, you know, some of the most heartfelt things that I could say that, that would help you to understand kind of where we're coming from. But I thought, what would it be like if there were no public transportation and people were reduced to walking uh, and carrying their children and trying to lug to the grocery store and and, and just how poor their quality of life would be and how poor all of our quality of life would be if we saw that kind of burden going on with our neighbors. We have a wonderful idea in transportation, and you can see that we're already subsidizing it highly, uh, $6 to every $7 for every transit ride. And as I said, uh, it, each, each trip, it consists of more than run ride, so keep that in mind. Uh, but, but we have to do this, and we have to do this, and not only do we have to do this, we have to do it as, as, as well as we can. We have to have clean, dependable, uh, safe, uh, 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 wonderful transportation for those folks. We, we owe it to them, and we owe it to our community so that we have this highly civilized community. Do we build a whole new society around transportation, public transportation? No. Uh, you know, Wayne Huizinga realized that he made one fortune in waste management, and then he went to a blockbuster. And, and, you know, gosh, it used to be there was a blockbuster on every corner, but it became obsolete. And so he then went to what? AutoNation. He did not go he, into building trains. He went into what he thought was a growth industry in our country, which is still people buying automobiles. And, and, and he did not come back and say, folks, I'm going to repackage this. I'm going to paint the walls. I'm going to set up new shelves. Will you please come back to Blockbuster, get in your car, come rent a, rent a video, go to the pain that, and the neck that it is to bring it back the next day before noon. I mean, all of that that we did for how many years? How many years? I mean, it was like on Friday nights you had to go to Blockbuster, but those days are over, and, and now, you know, it's past it. And uh, I think that what we're looking at here is that we need to do what they already have determined in this um, no new revenue scenario, 
which is to prioritize frequency. I'm reading from PSTA's bus study, which is to prioritize frequency, which means the buses come more often so that the woman and her children in the groceries don't have to stand out there in the heat. They need to prioritize frequency on strong routes, you know what those are now, over coverage. Coverage meaning that they're everywhere, and that's why so many of them are running empty. They want to go to six routes at 15 minute weekday intervals. And as of at this time, PSTA, I believe, only has two routes at 15 minute intervals. Thank you. So this would actually increase it to six routes at 15 minute intervals, and 10 of the restructured routes would be discontinued. This is the solution, ladies and gentlemen. It's not that difficult. We need to fix our public transportation system with what we already own. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. And now we'll ask David uh, to return to the stage and conduct that final poll and wrap this thing up. Thank you all again. Thank you. Let's get a commission to do this again. All right. Uh, there have been some very strong arguments made in the last hour and a half. And let's see how persuasive the uh, speakers were. In the first uh, survey, 60% said uh, they favored the referendum, 27.5% said they did not favor it, and 12.5% uh, were undecided. So let's go back to the, the texting of our cell phones. Same number to get on. If you didn't do anything with texting in, during this hour, you, you're still there. Type in YREF2 if you uh, favor the tax proposal. Uh, N R E F 2, that's if you oppose it, for no. And if you're still undecided, U R E F 2. Any questions? Chante, available to help if somebody gets stuck? Okay, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, well, I, I need to wait for the results. I, that's, the, that's the next point. Do you have a song dance routine at all? You might want to talk about that for me. Okay, well, yes, I could go on to the, the next. Um, I do want to ask you to give one more round of applause for our panel and for our moderator, Dr. Oliver, please. <laughs> and ho hopefully the panelists will stay around to take individual questions here and there. Uh, please save the date for our next program, April 17th, two weeks from tonight, when we're taking up another rather warm topic, the uh, re amendment, the uh, proposed amendment to our Constitution on the November ballot to legalize medical marijuana. You won't want to miss that. How are we doing on the campaign? 45, okay. 45 in all. Uh, Jacqueline going to have to help me with the percentages. 27, 28. Let's cut off the voting so we can get a, a solid count. Has everyone voted? A few hanging chads here. Some hanging chads. 30. 30, 21, and 2. So it looks like um, the, un the uh, yes column was uh, increased. The undecided column uh, when, uh, was decreased. More people, some people decided. Uh, the no column, um, Jacqueline, can you help me with the percentages here? Sixty-six percent for, fifty-six, I'm sorry, um, twenty-one, because we're, we're going with a larger number. How much? It's approximately the same, let's go. Okay, I, I can't get the approximate, can you? I don't know. Forty, okay, fifty-six, forty, and nil for undecided. Um, looks like the, uh, the no's went up 
the yeses went down slightly. The, there, there is a closer correlation now between uh, yes, yes and no, for and against. That means that both sides have some indication of where people stand for this straw poll, and it gives them a lot of uh, uh, impetus to mount their campaigns to uh, convince you and the rest of the county voters uh, to vote for their side. That concludes our program. I want to thank you very much for coming, and again, thank our panelists. Thank you for thank putting you. it on. Mm -hmm.